looky here, look who we've got here. How are you guys doing? Are you excited? Yes. You're a little nervous? Okay, relax, shake it off. Okay, you're just in the White House, it happens all the time. What have you all been doing since you got here? Just waiting? Didn't you do something yesterday? You shop, you shopped. Walk, a lot of walking. Well, that's good, that's good. Too much, there's no such thing as too much walking. Let's move, you remember that? Well, we're excited to have you here as we uh, enjoy the latest edition of the White House Music Series. Yay for us, we're very excited. Today, we are celebrating gospel music, and we have some wonderful singers and songwriters who are gonna participate in this conversation. We have Michelle Williams. We, yeah. we have Lyle Lovett. We have Darlene Love. Rodney Crowell. And Rhiannon Giddens is here. And to lead the discussion, my dear, dear friend who is, he is there for us through all of this, Bob Santelli from the Grammy Museum. Give Bob a hand. But most importantly, we have all of you. You all are really the stars of this portion of the day. This is my favorite part of the music series. Yes, give yourself a hand. Really. We started doing these workshops because we work closely with the Grammy Museum. They have a wonderful education and outreach initiative. But you know we have this big concert tonight, and there are a lot of fancy people who come in to see it. They're diplomats and rich people and, you know. <laughs> And they go in the East Room, but we started thinking, well, when is there space for us to connect all these wonderful people to young people all across the country? You all should have the opportunity to connect with some of these entertainers and artists that come and visit. So with the help of the Grammy Museum, we have always paired a workshop like this where we invite young people like you guys from all over the country to have an opportunity to talk about the music that we're focused on, to meet some of the artists that we get to hear from tonight. Some of them do a little singing while they're doing it. So it's really one of the most important and one of the most exciting parts about the music series is that we get to open this house up to you all. And hopefully this experience feels special because it's special for us. Um, we've got students here from Hawaii, that's okay. Shocker. Let's hear it. Yes, hometown. California. California. New York is here. We got a little Jersey in the house. Mississippi's here. Tennessee. And our backyard, Maryland. And Virginia. So pretty good representation. Now over the past few years, we have discussed everything from country to soul to classical music here at these workshops, and I'm really thrilled that we're really focusing on gospel. It's something that I've wanted to do since we started, so we finally got it done. Because this music, gospel music, has really played such an important role in our country's history. It really has, from the spiritual sung by slaves to uh, the anthems that became the, the soundtrack of the Civil Rights Movement, and to the hymns that millions of Americans sing every single day in churches all across the country. For so many of us, these songs are some of the very first melodies we ever hear. That was certainly true for me. Um, I come from a very music-loving family. Uh, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, was a big, huge jazz collector from way back. He used to wire his house for sound, and he played jazz every single day, all day, 24-7. And his sister, my Aunt Robbie, she was the director of the church choir, and so she also taught piano lessons to a lot of the kids in the neighborhood, and she taught those lessons in our home. So I would hear music lessons 
every day. Uh, my mother and some of her sisters were members of the church choir. Uh, so those are some of the earliest memories for me of having exposure to music. And it moved me so much that I wanted to start taking piano lessons at the age of four. I didn't keep it up, so I hope you all don't follow my lead on that, but it's, it's important to me. Gospel music is what fuels uh, my love of, of music in general. So I'm excited uh, to be hosting this here, and I know that so, for so many folks across the country and around the world, there's nothing like hearing uh, a choir sing an old gospel classic. Uh, you know, when you hear that, that, that music, it gets your feet tapping and your heart pumping. You know, it gets you ready and prepared to take in that sermon for the day. Um, it's what helps connect us to God, to that higher power. Um, and for so many, when times are dark and when you're struggling, gospel music is that ray of hope, and it gives you that strength. Um, and I know that that's the role that gospel music plays for so many, uh, because when you really think about it, we all are going to face some kind of struggle one day. We all do. No one on this stage is exempt from struggle. We're all up here because of some kind of struggle or, or, or dark thing we had to overcome. Uh, and I hope that the folks up here will share some of your, their stories with you. But I'd like to take a moment just to share a bit of Darlene Love's story uh, right now. Because Darlene got her first break back in 1962. I may get the dates wrong, but she sang the lead on a song called He's a Rebel, which was a song that went to the top of the charts. But something that happened to her that happened to a lot of artists, a lot of African-American artists, is that the producer released the record under someone else's name. Uh, and so nobody even knew that it was Darlene's voice providing uh, the, the power behind that song. Uh, and even as Darlene went on to sing back up on some of the biggest hits in the 60s, like Chain Gang, Rockin' Robin, and You've, got, uh, You've Lost That Loving Feeling, her name remained completely unknown, which is the case for many backup singers and great singers alike. They were unknown voices. And as the year passed, her career slowed down, and uh, by the early 80s, she was completely out of music, and she was cleaning houses. She was cleaning homes and, and working at a dry cleaning shop to get by. But one day, while she was cleaning someone else's bathroom, Darlene said she heard one of her songs on the radio, and, and that's when it hit her that she needed to get back to her passion, that she had gone so far away from what she cared about and what moved her. That song woke her up. So she started singing again. She started singing on cruise ship. Yes, right. <laughs> and then she wrote her own album. And slowly but surely, she started getting more and more recognition for all those classics. And they did a beautiful documentary of backup singers that I hope you all have, will see if you haven't seen. But Darlene is featured in that documentary, which highlights all of the amazing backup singers that make the music of our day. Uh, and now she is a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, finally earning her place among the legends. Now, she, hopefully you go even further into your story for these young people, but one thing, I, one, one line I want to use that she quoted, she said about her journey, she said, any time I got knocked back, I just looked at that as a hurdle I had to get over. And I, I share that with you because I want you all to know that you all have to prepare yourselves for those hurdles. That's the main thing I want young people who come through this house to understand is that life is inevitably filled with hurdles. You are going to fail and fail big a lot. But the best way to prepare yourself for recovering from that failure is to get your education. And I say that everywhere I go, because if there is anything you all need to be doing right now, is taking your education seriously. And seriously means that every day you show up strong. You go to class, <laughs> you do your work, 
you get the best grades you can get, you graduate from high school, and you have to do more. You have to go to college or go to a junior college. You have to. The jobs of the future are going to require you to be prepared. You've got to get some advanced training if you don't do that. There are many paths you can follow, but you got to make that happen for yourselves. So if, if, if you're passionate about anything, whether it's music or business or medicine or rocket science, school is your pathway. Education is your pathway. If it's music, you've got to have a fallback plan. Um, that's a, <laughs> having a fallback plan helps. But don't get discouraged when you hit those hurdles. And I'm sure many of you have already felt like you've hit some hurdles already. But we all have done it. And the power is your ability to recover and to be resilient. That's what makes people great. It's not that they've just glided through without any form of struggle. The people who are successful are the people who can get back up when they're knocked down. So don't be discouraged, you know. Just keep working hard. It is all hard work, but it is absolutely worth it. And I hope that you learn that from the folks on the stage. That's why we wanted them here. Uh, we wanted to talk about the genre, but we also hope that you walk away a little more inspired to be as great as you can be, because we're counting on you. President, First Lady, we're all counting on you to take over that baton and to be the leaders of tomorrow and you all can do it. So use this time here wisely. Relax, get comfortable, ask a lot of questions. Do not be shy, this is your home. Um, and we are all here because we believe in you. This is the best part of the day. So take advantage of it, okay? Don't be shy, all right? Now I have to go, because they make me work all day long. <laughs> So I'm going to turn it over to Bob and to all our performers and our entertainers and songwriters. And I hope you guys have a terrific time. Thank you for being here. Keep working hard. We love you guys. The first lady, everyone. OK. Okay, well, as the First Lady said, welcome to the White House and welcome to the White House Music Series. This has been going on, I think this is maybe the 10th or 11th time that the Grammy Museum has had the opportunity to host one of these events. And for those of you who don't know, this is being streamed across the country. So there are many hundreds, if not thousands, of high schools that are also listening in to hear the stories, not just from the First Lady, but from the artists, and to share with you their love of American music. And that's really why we're here. I think the First Lady is so right when she says how important American music is to us as a nation and as a people. And almost every time I get up here and have this opportunity to talk about American music, I almost always start with the one essential premise that makes our nation and our nation's music more important and more powerful than almost every other nation on earth. And that is because, as I said yesterday during our little talk, we are a nation of immigrants. And so each of us comes from somewhere else. And each of us comes from somewhere else where a previously existing music culture was. And we brought that here, or our grandparents or parents, whoever it might be, brought those musical roots and passions here. And we put it into one big, if you will, cauldron. And we stirred it up, and we have this tremendous, beautiful, endlessly exciting thing called American music. And over the past four years or so, we've talked about some of them in country music, and blues, and soul, and Memphis soul, and Detroit Motown, civil rights music, as the First Lady said. But today, we finally get a chance to talk about one of the most important one of the most essential of all American music forms, and that is gospel. And the reason why I say that, well, there are actually a couple of reasons why I say that. The first is that it's been around an awful long time, and it has roots all the way back to the founding of this country. The second is because even though it is a sacred music form, 
essentially born in the church and sung in the church. It has a lot of connections to the kind of music that's on your iPods today, the kind of music that we listen to, pop music. There's a connection there, as we're going to find out in just a little bit. But gospel music, as I say, goes all the way back to the founding of this country. When Africans came to this country by way of slavery, they weren't able to bring too much with them in terms of material possession, but they brought the most important thing, the most valuable thing, and that's what was in their heart, what was in their soul, and that was almost always music. And that music came here, the idea of rhythm and a beat and a sensuality and, a, and a, an emotional intensity to this music that when Europeans came here and heard that, they were absolutely just astounded by the power of music. Well, the Europeans, particularly the English and the Irish and the Scottish, they brought their own music as well. And they had religious music too. But in the African tradition, music was just about important in everything. From the time you woke up and to the time you went to bed, whether it was a hunt, whether it was marriage, whether it was a funeral, there was always music. So when you put these two things together, the white European tradition and the black African tradition, that's the secret also to American music. It's this wonderful creative tension that exists between Africa and Europe, and it comes to America, and now we have American music. In the early days, of course, with slavery, not a pretty time for our history, but coming from slavery came this thing called the Negro spiritual. And the Negro spiritual was absolutely important to the day-to-day -day existence of slaves, because through that music, slaves were able to gain a sense of hope, a sense of a better life. If it wasn't going to come on this earth, it was going to come in heaven. Not in this life, then in the afterlife. And so those Negro spirituals provided the hope, the sense of salvation, the belief that sometime, somewhere, somehow, things were going to get better. When they became Christians, as the Europeans insisted that they do. Now, all of a sudden, we had two different kinds of churches with two different kinds of singing traditions. We had the European tradition of singing in church, which was rather stiff and rather formal, nonetheless important, and the African-American style, which was full of emotional intensity and rhythm and style and improvisation, things that would ultimately be parts of all American music later on. And through the years, these two forms, these now gospel forms, created a sacred music tradition in this country. But don't let the black-white thing throw you off. Even though for much of the gospel tradition, America was a segregated country, which also meant our churches were segregated, the fact is, and as these musicians will tell you, there was an overlap where black players and musicians listen to white musicians and songwriters, and white musicians and songwriters listen to black, and kids stood outside black churches who were white and listened to the music going on in those churches, and the, and the other thing happened on the other side as well, or they listened to the Grand Old Opry on Saturday nights and listened to white country music coming out of the South. So there was always, despite what America was experiencing segregation in music, not the case. There was this integration going on. That, too, is the beauty of American music. It's not until really the 1870s or so that we really see this word gospel come up, and it's really not until the 1920s until gospel is widely recognized as a powerful and unique American music form. Once again, the crossover, it's kind of interesting, and I'm sure Darlene and Rianne and, and Michelle can talk about this as well, but in traditional black culture and black families, if you were very religious, you listened to gospel music, you weren't probably listening too much of blues, or you weren't supposed to be listening to blues, which was the, sec uh, the secular music or the music you played on Saturday nights, right? But when you looked at it, there was a common denominator there. The music was powerful, it was soulful, it came from inside. And no matter what it was singing about, you might be singing about dancing on a Saturday night and finding Jesus on a Sunday morning. The fact is, the music was powerful and it touched you in different ways. One of the great gospel songwriters, Tom Dorsey, in Chicago in the late 1920s. He was a blues writer and then kind of saw the light after the death of his, of his wife and begins to write gospel. But he came from the blues tradition 
and some, he made some pretty radical blues songs in the 1920s as well, but crossed over. And then you start to think in the 1940s and 1950s, if you heard about Sam Cooke or the great Aretha Franklin or James Brown or any of these monumental African-American artists, they too, they too came from the church. They learned how to sing in the church. Whitney Houston, I had a chance to see Whitney Houston when she was 16 years old. I'm originally from New Jersey, and she sang in the New Hope Baptist Church Choir in Newark, New Jersey. I couldn't believe, couldn't believe how good she was. But it's not surprising that she became who she was in terms of a singer. She learned it in the church. The great Aretha Franklin, who'll be performing tonight, and Darlene Love, and everybody else, they had that connection to gospel music because gospel music teaches you to express yourself. What you are feeling at the time is what you should be singing. And that's a pretty powerful thing. You compare that to classical music, and no disrespect to classical music, it has its important place in our culture and in terms of world culture. But there's not a whole lot of reading and saying, I have to do it this way, this how, every single time. When you're feeling it in gospel mu music, you're supposed to sing it that way. And that is the inherent beauty of that music as well. So you have this situation where gospel music and pop music coexist, sometimes overlapping, but in the end, it is a defining music form of who we are as Americans. And today, you can go anywhere in the world, just like you can in terms of pop music, and you can hear gospel music in the Philippines, and you can hear gospel music in Austria, and you can hear gospel music in China. It has now become not just exclusively American music. It's world music now. And that's a good thing, because one of our greatest cultural exports, without question, is our music. And our music continues to grow. We lost a great gospel great gospel, seminal leader in that music, Andre Crouch, just a little while ago out in Los Angeles, someone who could really capture the essence of the music. But there are other people always coming up, perhaps some of you, and you heard last night when we were at Howard University and interacting with the choir there. When they sang, when they sang, their hearts went in, and yours did too. It was so great to see some of you, perhaps who've never sung those songs, to get deep into it and feel it. That fuels us. It fuels us musically and culturally, but as the First Lady said too, it also should fuel us personally because gospel sends a spirit of redemption and salvation and hope. So when you are down on your luck, if you're feeling the world has just given you a wrong turn or something bad has happened, you can turn to a gospel song and you can hear someone else sing it and be inspired, or you sing it to yourself in the shower. If, have, if you have to, but you can sing it and you gain inspiration and strength from that. That is the beauty of gospel music. I can talk a lot about this, but there are people here who experience it and who sing it a whole lot better than I do. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce my guests here, and they're going to talk a little bit about their experiences in music, how they got to be where they are today, and any connection that they may have to the American gospel tradition. So I'll start with, with Michelle. Obviously, with Destiny's Child, that's a pretty big pop entity that you were involved in, but early on, where do you learn how to sing? Well, I come from a small town outside of Chicago called Rockford, Illinois, and um, attended a church, um, still do, it's my family's church. Pentecostal Church, St. Paul, Church of God in Christ. You gotta say the whole thing, by the way. It's too many syllables, it's just too much. I sang my first solo at the age of seven, a hymn called Blessed Assurance, and gospel music really is my first love. I love all genres, but it's something about gospel music that is my first love. Lyle, if I'm not mistaken, you too learned to sing in the church, didn't you? I did. I, yeah. you know, I grew up, I grew up in, in uh, one of those more European-based yeah. churches right. uh, that, that sang those, uh, as you, you described, maybe a little stiffer music. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, singing, anytime you get to sing. I, I started singing in, in uh, uh, grade school and sang in the children's choir in church. And singing is just a joyful experience. And yeah. I, I got to experience that. As a, as a young child, and it was something that I looked forward to doing yes. every day. Mm -hmm. And when we'd get to sing in church, my goodness, you know, we'd all get nervous, and we'd all want to do our best, mm -hmm. and we'd all rely on the better singers in, in the choir. And I knew when to be 
went to sing quiet enough where nobody could hear me. Let's let the good singers really, really step up. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, you know that that uh, all my life in getting to sing, that part hasn't changed. You know, it's it's such an inspiration when you get to meet people you admire. When you get to stand next to somebody that that you know can do whatever they do really well, you it's just joyful. And and uh, to be here in this company is you know it's I you know I just couldn't be more excited. So that's, you know, when you, when you find something in school that you love to do, uh, there's just not a, a greater blessing in life than knowing something, knowing that you love something and being able to pursue that, you know, because when you do, when you, when you work at something that you love to do, it just doesn't feel like work. Yeah. You know? It just feels like fun. Yeah. Yeah. Darlene, obviously the first lady recounted some of your story, but I'm wondering, who were some of your influences? Did you have gospel singing influences early on as, as a young person growing up? I was the one that rock and roll, rhythm and blues was not allowed to be played in my okay. house. Uh -huh. So I only heard it when I hung out with my girlfriends. Uh -huh. um, my roots, uh, who I loved and really thought I was gonna sing like was uh, Marian Anderson. Mm -hmm. And I just loved her statue and how she performed. And of course, Mahalia Jackson. Right. Uh, you know, I go way back to the real old gospel singers, which I really still love today, and that's the kind of music that actually keeps me, because like you said, you can be really down and out, but you put on one of those records, and it really will lift your spirits up, and I have never found anything that could lift your spirits, yeah. like gospel or spiritual music. Yeah. And I come from a family who, like Aretha and Sam Cooke, my father was a pastor, he was a minister, so my father actually got a lot of flack when I decided to start singing secular music, or as they called it, the devil's Devil. music. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I, back in 1968, I did a television show called Shindig. And it was the first musical show that was on television. And now the members of our church was watching it. Oh boy. So they would go to my father and say, I can't believe you allowing your daughter to sing that devil's music. <laughs> and my father would say to them, well, why were you watching it? <laughs> if you had never been watching it, you would have never known she was doing it. So I would tell all you young people, it's so much fun. You have all the downtime. You're going to have that, so just be ready for it. But when you get to the good part of it, just ravish it and love it because it's so good to be able to lift people's spirits. And when I walk on the stage, that is really my desire, yeah. is to lift people's spirits. No matter what you have gone through to today, when you come to a Darling Love show, I came on stage, no matter what I'm going through, to lift your all spirits. And music has been good for me, even though I've been through so many ups and downs as a background singer. And as uh, the first lady said, if you don't have a, haven't seen 20 Feet from Stardom, you should go and see it because it tells you what we all went through as background right. singers. Right. Yeah, thank you for that. Rodney, uh, growing up, obviously, it, we hear a lot about white gospel and black gospel. And as I tried to say, the common denominator is great music there. But there was a, a sense of more formality in, 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 um, uh, in traditional Protestant, white Protestant churches. Did you grow up in, in an environment like that where you learned to sing as well in that setting? Well, my mother and father uh, were sons and daughters of sharecrop farmers very poor. They lived in way in the outback of Tennessee, of western Tennessee and western Kentucky. And this was a time when radio was really the only outlet they had to the rest of the world. So the music that, you know, from WSM in Nashville, Tennessee, that would go out to, you know, these poor, poor white people, basically, you know, what they did, they tended someone else's farm, yeah. sharecrop farmers is what they were. But music was central to life. It was actually the only escape you really had. Now, my, my family, I mean, Scotch-Irish, classic, Saturday Night Sinners, Sunday Morning Redemption. Right. They drank heavily <laughs> <laughs> and were contrite on Sunday morning. Yeah. But the music was really beautiful and free. And, and actually, in my family, 
we thought nothing of my favorite Aunt Tippy and her, she had the biggest farmhouse when I was very young and in my family we played guitars. Every, if you could play, you would play and sing. Yeah. And if you couldn't, the furniture got moved out of the way and everybody danced. So I come from a family who danced like the Dickens to gospel music, yeah, yeah. and <laughs> with no shame. <laughs> now, ev in every other way in their lives, outward in the world, they were ashamed of how poor they were. But when the music got inside your heart and comes back out, shame starts to, right. to go away, and, and you become energized with the Spirit of God. Yeah. And that, to me, the career I've had in music has been one way or another trying to capture that essence of what I believe God to be or the higher power, yeah. as the first lady said, and to share it. Yeah. And there's joy, and it, it is the healing energy of the universe. Yeah. And it was really big in my family. Mm -hmm. Rhiannon, last night one of our students here asked a great question to the Howard University Choir, and they said, does gospel music then bring you closer to God? And because it is a religious music. I'm just wondering how, how you would answer that question. Well, I often, I mean, I do, a, I, I'm what you would call a music nerd. Um, I was just a regular old nerd, and then I turned into a music nerd. Um, <laughs> and I, I get asked a lot, we do, the music that I do is, is very based in histor history, and, and sometimes I get asked, you know, how do I do this kind of music, i.e. I'm not of this culture, or I'm not, or, you know, or whatever. And so, so I've thought a lot about who has the right to sing music. And, and I tend to, and, and I think it goes with when you're singing a gospel song, you know, how are you approaching it? And so for me, it's why are you singing a song? It should always be the first thing ever, no matter what you're doing, whether you're singing a classical piece or, or a gospel piece. And for me, if you're singing a gospel piece, you have to be connected to the greater. Right. You have to be connected to, you know, the essence that is bigger than yourself. And, you know, whatever that is for you, you know, what, whatever the name is of that, you know, for you, I think there's no point in singing a gospel song unless you are feeling that, you yeah. know, yeah. unless you are trying to communicate that. So that's all I would ever say about it is, is it's between you and your God you know, and that's where it begins and where it ends. And if you don't have that, then maybe put it aside for right. now, you know, but that's, that's kind of how, I, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, but. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Music obviously is a powerful force. You've all felt it personally. We've all felt it as listeners or for some of you amateur performers. When I mentioned before about using gospel as a form of, of a pick-me-up or as a form of salvation and looking deeper into this music. Sometimes in pop music, it's entertainment. We can dance and enjoy it. It almost becomes kind of like sonic wallpaper. It's in the back of our minds. We're doing other things. But when it comes to gospel, there's such an intense one-on-one -on -one experience, I think, with you, the performer, and the song, that it allows for a deeper, more meaningful hearing of that song. Lyle, I was just wondering if you can comment, are, are there any songs that you sing or that you learned as a young person in which you can kind of point that out and illustrate that? Is that possible? Oh, gosh. You know, well, the, the hymns that we would sing hymns. were in, inspiring to me. And, and, and it's not, uh, you know, if, if you uh, are a believer, uh, you, you can be inspired by the, by the words. You can be inspired by the message in, in a, a hymn or in a, in a gospel song. But you can, uh, uh, even if you're not, you can be inspired by the music. You can be moved to that emotion uh, to, that's, that's built into those words. Yeah. And, and, uh, and in a way, you know, it's a, it's a great privilege as a believer to, to sing to people who may have different beliefs. Because if, if, you, if you connect through the music with that, if, you, if you're able to, to portray the emotion in that, in that music and and, uh, and other people can feel that, it, it brings, it, you know, it just might bring them a step closer to believing as well. Yeah. Please. When you are believers, you know, believers mean you're saved, you know God. But gospel music can also do something to someone who's never been in church. They'll say, I, don't, I feel something. I don't know what I feel, but keep going. Before you know it, you know, when you ask, does gospel connect you to God? It absolutely does, no matter 
what path you've taken in right. life, no matter what you've done, you abs it absolutely does connect you to God. Believers and non-believers, you like, when I was hearing your sound check, I was like, this is why I love gospel music. This is what keeps me grounded. This music keeps me from going crazy, doing stuff I should not be doing. I was like, this is why I'm so glad my mom kept me in church every other day. <laughs> it's something that just, ooh. Yeah. I'm looking forward to tonight, by the way. <laughs> I'm gonna get my everlasting life <laughs> tonight. I'm gonna shout a little bit, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mention this, but I will right now. Gospel music, it sounds r relatively simple, right? It's not. It's really complicated in the manner in which it's delivered. For instance, you can go from just a single person singing a cappella, meaning no instruments, your voice, and that's it, right? And then there are things called gospel quartets. You know, these are quartets, four people singing, and singing in beautiful harmony, four-part harmony. Very difficult to do, but a powerful music form. When you hear it, it just kind of melts you. Or we have gospel choirs. Gospel choirs could be 100, 150 people strong. This wave, this tidal wave of voice coming at you all carrying the same message, all carrying the same emotion. These are very, very powerful, and it really is, I think, and, and Darlene and, and, and Rodney, if you guys would care to comment on this, but you know, it, it doesn't matter necessarily what form you take, whether you are one person in a choir or whether you are singing solo, but for you, what is your favorite? What's your favorite kind of gospel? When I say gospel, what's the favorite kind that comes to your mind? You know what, I think, I think when I was singing with my Baptist choir, uh, my father allowed us uh, to go and sing, uh, be in one of the largest churches in Los Angeles back in the 50s. Yeah. It was called St. Paul Baptist Church. Sure. And anybody that was anybody came through that church. And when we sing with a choir that can sing, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you feel it down in your toes. You know what I'm saying? And it can be any song. But like them, I love the old, old hymns. On the first Sunday in my church, if I'm home, my pastor always asks me to sing. It's our communion Sunday. And because I know all the old, we call them the blood songs. Yeah, the blood songs. <laughs> and those are the songs you really, and those are the songs you know just sing from your heart. And they really do say a lot to the, I think that's why I love like Mahalia Jackson, uh, the Claire Ward singers, right. the Davis sisters, the Caravans, you know, because they, they didn't have nothing but a piano, but they had a man that played the piano like he was playing 10 instruments, yeah, yeah. you know, so that's what yeah. the, the songs are that, sure. that thrill me, that I just yeah. love. And in the, in the white tradition, especially in your part of the country, Tennessee, Kentucky, there were these great quartets, you know, some of the, the harmonies were just incredible, just seamless, beautiful. You know, um, I'm thinking, you know, primarily uh, being a songwriter, being known most of all as a songwriter. Yeah. People, I always say when people ask me about songs I've written, I say the best songs I've written are prayers. And, and, um, and when I think about, you know, some of my if you want to mention really great songs that transcend, you take a song like Bridge Over Troubled Water, mm -hmm. Paul sang. Yeah. It's a prayer, yeah. you know, and uh, change is going to come, you know, it's a prayer. And add four part harmony to a prayer, mm -hmm. you're starting to widen the chance yeah, that it. the change is going to come. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I'm gonna ask one more question to Rhiannon and then I am gonna turn it over to you guys and you can ask some questions. One of the great things that we did here four years ago where the very first program we did was we celebrated the music of the civil rights era. And we really came to the conclusion that day that had you taken the music out of the civil rights movement, it would have been difficult for the civil rights movement to succeed because music gave those marchers courage and strength. You can imagine being young and moving toward a sea of billy clubs or snarling German shepherds or fire hoses. You needed something to keep you moving and music was often that. And a lot of that music 
came from the church. It was kind of like gospel songs with new lyrics. Was that something that was meaning for you, as meaningful for you, Rhiannon, as, as you grew up and, and, and now as a, as a performer? Well, yeah, I mean, the more, the more that I research, you know, because that's what I do, the more that I listen to the older stuff, the more that I learn about the history, and the more that I learn about the history of, of not just the civil rights movement, but the, you know, slavery, the, the beginning of this country, and also other cultures around the world who use music as a form of protest, music as a form of expression, as a form of outlet. It's not just us, you know? This is a worldwide thing. Music is the, the thing that keeps us going. And in this country, it, it became this, you know, the, especially during slavery times, this focal point of we can say things with these spirituals that we can't say anywhere else. This is the energy that's gonna keep us from imploding, it's gonna keep us alive, it's gonna keep our spirits alive. And to see that echoed in the civil rights movement, and it just, what it does is it connects you, because yeah. you realize that none of this is in a vacuum. Right. None of this occurs on its own, and so, not only are we tied into the history of this country, we're also tied into the history of the world, you know? And it's the, it's the human condition, the connection to a greater power, whatever you want to call it, even if it's the power of community, is a human condition, and that's what keeps us all going. Absolutely. Now let's turn it over to you. Who has a question? Yes, ma'am. Hello. There you go. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Ariana. I'm from Los Angeles, California, representing the Brotherhood Crusade. Um, I just want to thank you guys for coming out, and I appreciate. I'm um, glad I have the opportunity to be here. Um, you guys are very inspirational. Um, my question is, do you guys uh, think creativity through music can be taught, or one has to find it themselves? Good question. Does it need to be taught? Can it be taught, or do you find creativity within yourselves? Anyone? Michelle? I would say both. <laughs> there are some things that, you know, I was taught that helps you to be creative because sometimes you could have something in you, but when you start to know something, you get knowledge of something, you can build on that. Can soul be taught? Probably not. <laughs> That's why it's called soul. It comes from the inside. Pray I answered it correctly. Yeah, but I, I, and I, but I think that soul can, can be uncovered. Yeah. It can be coaxed, mm -hmm. it can be helped, it can be shaped, So because we all have a soul. Yeah. And so you have to find a way or a mentor or somebody who can help you yeah. pull it out, well, however that is, you know? Yeah. That's true. And having your soul nurtured like that through, yes. through learning something is just the most exciting feeling that you'll ever experience. And, uh, and when, you, when you latch on to something and somebody who can show you more than you know, it's a, you know, you have to do it yeah. every time. Right else over here? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Kate Rogers, and I'm from New Jersey, Harvard Technology University. Thank you. And my question is, do you have any advice for someone looking for a job in the business part of the music industry? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one today because, um, Managers, I found out, and agents, they sit and wait for somebody to call you, or they don't go out and really work and sell the artists anymore like they used to do years ago. Years ago, managers used to really be managers, and they managed your career. Uh, the best thing I did when I wanted to be on Broadway, I went to every cattle call, every audition, mm -hmm. everything, and there's a book uh, that they have on Broadway called Backstreet, and you see where every audition is, and that was my Bible. Mm -hmm. And I went to everything mm -hmm. until I started doing Broadway. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's rough, it's hard to say how today, mm -hmm. because I think you get a little lost if you become stars on, from the shows that are out today, you know, like Idol and, mm -hmm. and those shows. I don't think they're really prepared for what is going to happen to their lives, yeah. you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. And they get kind of lost in the shuffle. So it's kind of up to you as uh, people and young entertainers to get that energy out and go and look for it yourself. There are mm -hmm. books, there are magazines, there are plenty. I think that, for me, that's the best way to find it unless you luck up on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rodney? I, was, I would think there's good news about, I would think, 
the young lady here, she was asking about creativity. And I would say in the entertainment business right now, one thing that's really needed is creativity. And so if you can express it through the business, go on, do it. It needs you. I hate to always piggyback off questions, but I get um, that question a lot. And I tell people, um, I don't know if they still do it today, but in the back of like Billboard magazine and your music trade magazines, always look for dates of conferences, you know, and workshops. Always be getting educated. There's a book I believe called the, the Business of Music. Whether it was written in 1970, a lot of that basic stuff still works in 2015. Um, Playbill.com, you know, for Broadway, it also helps with people who, who everybody doesn't want to be an entertainer. There are some who want to work technical areas and be vocal coaches and dancers. And who here wants to be a doctor to take care of us crazy musicians? <laughs> you know what I mean? Go to Playbill.com. You can always find, you know, things that they are looking for. But you can get in, and sometimes it's who you know. Can, can I just add, um, I don't know if this yep, is, yeah. I just wanna add, I, I think in overall terms, it's really important to hone your instincts about people. Continue to hone your instincts and you'll know, is this person, is this someone I can trust? And slowly start building a group of people who you can trust around you. I mean, because the, the music industry is all about who you know, who you trust, and you build that network you take your time, just build the network and you know, mm -hmm. think about the long term. Mm -hmm. But I bet, to summarize, all of you have a common denominator and that is that you really wanted to do this, that you were driven to this and that pretty much, and especially to hear your story too, darling, nothing was gonna get in your way. You, you have it in your de the desire to express yourself, the desire to be something that you aspire to be. I think that incredible appetite just that appetite, you have to feed it. And, it's, and many people have that, and then eventually they lose it. And you know, we all know people who started in high school or college and they wanted to be singers and performers like you and they dropped out, but you stayed with it. It's all about looking at it for the long haul and probably wanting it so bad that you can almost taste it. You know, it's just that powerful a drive. And that holds true whether you, you want to be an entertainer or a doctor or a politician or a, an electrician. It doesn't matter. Having that, and, and I think the First Lady is always fond, I know whenever I hear her speak, she's talking about young people having a dream and having something to shoot for and aspire to. Those are the real keys. Those are the gifts that you have now. You need to take advantage of them. And whether you want to be a singer or a politician or an electrician, the idea is to find that as soon as you can and then start that path towards success and to fulfillment of that dream or that goal. Let's take a couple of more questions. In the back, yes ma'am. Hello, my name is Mariah Hunt. I attend North Carolina A&T State University in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I am here representing Youth Villages. My question is, I wrote it down, um, can you share a time or a moment when gospel music played a vital role in your resiliency? And anyone on the panel can Good answer question. this question. Someone? Um, Michelle? All the time. I couldn't sleep last night. And um, matter of fact, I, I, for some reason, I couldn't sleep till, get to sleep till four o'clock this morning. I was pretty upset about that because I'm not a morning person, so I was looking forward to eight hours of sleep. So around midnight, I put on a song called Just To Know by Charles Jenkins. Before you know it, I wasn't emotional. Before you know it, I'm just <laughs> I had to turn the song off because that's not what, you know. But music, um, Gospel music just, sometimes it reminds you of your purpose. It reminds you why you should stay uh, relentless and be strong and, and, and be resilient because you're gonna have those times. Maybe I am going through something that I didn't know about that brought those tears or could have been tears of joy. Like, man, God, I do want to be closer to you. And even in this midnight hour, I can feel you. So, man, gospel is the best. You know, I, I don't know how I got in the group and we sang Bootylicious, but man. <laughs> man, you know.
I will never forget uh, my uncle, who's a bishop, came to the concert and we sang that song. I was like, man, can we cut off after the first chorus? <laughs> I don't want to sing my part, but um, oh well, it is what it is. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Yeah. My name is Joshua Vega, and I represent the Brotherhood Crusade, and I'm from Los Angeles, California. And uh, my question is, from gospel, straight from church, how did you guys take the church business and make it into an entertainment industry where you guys could take all you guys do into the stadiums and share it worldwide? So from the intimacy of the church, the stadiums, and big performance halls. That's kind of easy. Well, it was easy for me because we started out singing small, 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 and the audience got bigger, 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 bigger. And which was good for me by being a background singer, I was on the stage with Cher, with Elvis, with, you know, with Sam Cooke. So, and that's when you sung for thousands of people. And in my mind, I see it one day, I'm gonna sing for that many people. So you can have that in you already. Right. You know, it's one of those desires, you know, like you have in you and it'll just come out. And what was nice about singing with those people, I loved Elvis so much especially when I found out his love for gospel. That was his first love. And he told me a story that was very interesting. He said that he used to go on a Sunday night to a black church in the South. And back then, they didn't have air conditioning. They had their windows, and windows were open. And he would go and just stand at the window and listen to the music, which was amazing. So it's always in there. So it just, it's a change because even when I'm singing, like I'm singing uh, Do Run Run or He's a Rebel or one of those songs, I'm singing it to you, but I'm thinking about, you know, wow, Do Run Run Run, Do Run Run, okay? You know what I'm saying? So you can always take those songs somewhere else. And I used to sing in my show, A Change Is Gonna Come. Yeah. And that song really makes you emotional oh, because yeah. it can mean oh, anything yeah. that you're going through. You know, not a lot of people know this. Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, king of rock and roll. He won a couple of Grammys for gospel music. Never won for rock and roll, won it for gospel music. So much was he a performer and, and a fan and lover and singer of, of gospel music. Let's take just a couple of more questions. Yes, young lady right here. You, yeah, yeah. Good. Um, my name is Katie Noth. I'm from Somers, New York. Um, I was wondering, like especially with like rock and roll and like other kinds of music, how do you think like the elements of gospel can like be integrated and how like it helps spread it? I don't know if that's phrase weird. So how does rock and roll help spread gospel music? It helps spread gospel and how they influence each other. Okay, so how does pop music in essence help spread what gospel music is all about? Pretty much, you take the blues, you take gospel music and uh, Piano is a big, big instrument in the church, and put it in the hands of Jerry Lee Lewis, yeah. and it becomes great balls of fire, <laughs> <laughs> rock and roll, you know. And uh, it's the spirit of gospel music, and the joy. And I mean, the joy in gospel, the joy and the spirit, and the joy and the self-expression in rock and roll. You put them together, and, and you just can't stop yeah. it. It's a pretty irresistible force, that's for sure. Let's take one more question. Yes, in the back, young lady in the green. Yes, right here. Hello, thanks for coming and doing this. Um, I'm Amber Foster. I'm from Cleveland in the Mississippi Delta, and we're representing Delta State University. Um, this may be a difficult question, but we're all here in celebration of something very special to music lovers, and it sh the celebration shouldn't stop here. How can we, as oncoming adults um, inspire the younger generation to continue the celebration for gospel music or any music? Good question. How do we pass it on to the next generation, our love of this music and the importance of this music? I'm going to hand it to Mike to Rhiannon. She's already talked about research, which is to study and to learn. You want to expand on that? I mean, I, I think the, the more you know, the more you can tell. The, you, when you learn something, it hasn't, it's not complete until you have taught it to someone else. You know, that's, that's what makes us, you know, who we are. And so the more you can learn about it, the more you can, you know, know where it comes from. And then the other thing that I wanted to say was there is too much focus in this, in this 
um, in this culture on performance. There's too much focus on being a star or becoming, like in terms of music, sing the music, play the music together, you know, keep it alive and, and invite somebody who's younger and say, come be in, you know, come sing with me, let's do this music. You know, we have to stop focusing on, you know, what we do. You know, we've chosen to make it a career and you don't have to make it a career to be a musician. You don't have to be a professional to make a wonderful music. And I think gospel, it's even more important to keep that spirit of, of just let's make this music together and let's pass it on. And, and also coming from an artist standpoint, um, touring with Destiny's Child. I mean, we sang R&B, but every show, every tour, we sang a gospel song. And I think, you know, when you have a platform and if you know God, I think you should share it no matter what. No matter if it's the AMAs or the Billboard Awards, sneak a hymn in there. <laughs> you know, I know um, myself and the girls recently, we opened the Stellar Awards with one of my songs called Say Yes. It's an old Nigerian anthem or hymn. So it's kind of like, we don't care. No, no matter what the platform is, you know, throw it in there. When you're talking about how to keep young people interested in it, I think you should sing it anywhere you can. Play it anywhere you can. When you're going to out at night, on a Saturday night, <laughs> you might want to keep yourself covered and play a gospel song. <laughs> you know, and Roland Martin is shaking his head, but I'm going to tell you, mm, that's what we did sometimes. You know, but um, just play it. Just keep, you know, expose somebody else to it. Because all of my, all of our, well, I guess we all have children. No, well, maybe no. <laughs> But I introduced my children to gospel music. Uh, my oldest son is 54. So they all have listened to gospel music all their lives. And then they had to go to church and hear their grandfather preach on Sundays. So they told their friends about it. And then, you know what was amazing? They brought their friends to church. Man, you got to hear this choir, man. They blow, man. They can sing. And that's how you do it. If you really love it, you can really convince other people to come and enjoy it with you. And we w couldn't possibly end this program without, we're talking a lot about singing, but now we need to hear some. So we've asked Rhiannon if she would basically just cultivate this crowd here with a little bit of a cappella gospel from one of today's most exciting singers. Please put your hands together for Rhiannon. So I'm a very um, proud North Carolinian, Greensboro. Um, and in talking about the research and, and, and finding out the, about the music of my state, there's a great tradition of sibling gospel um, harmonies, um, like the Badgett sisters and the Branchettes, and, and I actually sing these with my sister. Um, she's not here today. So I'm gonna sing one on my own, which will be weird, but I'll do it. Um, <laughs> it's called, I Know I've Been Changed. <clears throat> I know I've been changed. I know I've been changed. I know I've been changed. The angels in heaven done sign my name. If you get to heaven before I do. The angels in heaven done sign my name. Tell all my friends I'll be coming home soon. The angels in heaven done sign my name. You know I no, I've been changed. I know I've been changed. I know I've been changed. The angels in heaven done sign my name. 
There's a two white horses standing side by side. The angels in heaven done sign my name. Can't nobody ride but the sanctified. The angels in heaven done sign my name. You know why. No, I've been changed. Oh, I. No, I've been changed. I. No, I've been changed. The angels in heaven done sign my name. The angels in heaven done sign my name. The angels in heaven done sign my name. You know what? I think we should ask Miss Darlene Love to sing one too. What do you think? Yes. <sighs> that was spoof. <laughs> <laughs> Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadow why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion a constant friend is he his eyes on the sparrow and I know he watches me his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me, I sing, because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free for his eye is on the Okay, well, this has been a great day. This has been a happy day, hasn't it? Yeah. You bet. Happy day.
That was great. Thank you, Mrs. Obama. Thank you, White House staff. Thank you, my guests. And thank you all for coming all the way here at the White House. Go out and carry the message. Go out and carry the message. Have a great day. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you next time. Okay.